All right, it's time for my year end reviews. <laughs> So, as I stated, if you watched my wrap up video, um, I only read two books in the month of December just because I wanted to take it easy, focus on family, that kind of stuff. And so, I'm going to be sharing those two reviews with you today. But I'm also going to be sharing my spoiler review for uh, Tristan Strong um, Keeps Punching. I had planned, of course, to do a separate video for that, but you know what? It just comes right down to time. It's something that I want to do. I have the time to do it now. So I'm just going to put this all together. I will let you know when the review is coming up so that you have plenty of time to check out if you don't want to catch those spoilers. I will say it breaks my heart a little bit that I did not dedicate an entire video just to that. But I got to get better at time management. So <laughs> that's what it boils down to. So let me go ahead and do what I do. Let me share my screen and um, look at my uh, reviews for the two books that I did read in December. All right, here we go. So the two books that I read in December were for the IWSG Book Club. Um, that's a wonderful book club that's been going on for a long time. And it's um, just based on the community of the Insecure Writer Support Group started by Alex Kavanaugh. Um, this year, we switched focuses so that we are reading books by members. And so this is fairly new. And it was nice to end out the year on, you know, two books that support a community that I've been so blessed to be a part of. And so let's right, get into it. Uh, Falling for the Villain. I gave it a four star. And here is my review. You know what? Let me make my screen just a little bit bigger. I feel like I'm not really speaking to you guys if I don't do that. <laughs> All right, let's see, here we go. I enjoyed this book. It was, it's, ugh. <laughs> it was interesting to read about superheroes and villains in a non-comic book format. While this book is targeting YA readers, I think it appeals to adults too. Uh, might consider this a new adult book, but those usually have more mature content. And this book is pretty mild, even with the depictions of violence. So why adult it is? I like the world in which the story is set. It's clearly more expansive than we see in this installment, but I like that there is a possibility of seeing more in later installments. I think it was smart of the author to focus on one small city as an introduction to this world of superhero of superpowered beings, whether natural, whether natural born or due to radiation. <clears throat> I like both the hero and the villain right from the start, but then the hero goes through a transitional period where she begins to wonder if being a hero is even worth it and whether she's actually good at it. Um, I too was wondering the same thing as I was reading it. There were times when she just felt really naive, but in the long run, it served a purpose. My only major complaint about this book is that we get to see all of our heroine's faults, but not really any of the villains. It's like he's perfect in every way. Oh, and he just happens to be doing his part to make the heroine better too. Honestly, it was slightly condescending that our hero really didn't learn anything on her own. She learned <clears throat> it all secondhand unless I miss something. Still, by the end, she has grown a lot and I still really like her. I look forward to reading more of this series Recommend it to fans of superhero genre and enemies to friends plot lines. So all that just to say that I really did like the book. I really did like the characters. I just felt like there was more, I don't know, love given to the villain than to the superhero. I felt like everything that was kind of great about her all stemmed from this relationship that you read about in the story. But by the end of it, she does come into her own, but I just kind of felt like she should have been her own to begin with. But regardless, that's why it's a four star, not a five star. Just some character development stuff with the main um, female character. But other than that, good stuff. Hope to read more of it. All right. So the next thing I read was a five star review, Being Human. And I've actually read another story by this um, author this year. Um, just on a whim, um, again, being part of this IWSG community, it's a community of writers who blog, 
but there's also like a Facebook group of writers. And anyway, the idea was that I wanted to, you know, get involved in the community more. And so they were looking for someone to do like a like a like a blog hop or something like that. And um, I signed up for it. And that's how I read her first book. And so when it came time for her um, to be featured with a book club, I was really excited to see if, you know, what I read in her first book, if I was going to have the same experience with her second book. And I did. So let's just get into the review. <clears throat> this is the second book I've read from this author and realized I need to just start reading more of her stuff. I love the way she takes all the old and typical paranormal fantasy or science fiction tropes and gives them a fresh spin and perspective you don't expect. Um, I thought this book would mostly appeal to YA readers in the beginning, but I can see fans of adult fiction also appreciating this. It's a delicate balancing act the author is performing by depicting a set of twins where one never gets old and the other does. It adds a layer to the vampire trope I've never really seen. The depictions of violence and death in this book are graphic, but not gratuitous. As you read the story, you begin to understand that violence is in the nature of certain creature and that it's not a bad thing. Wolves can't eat bunnies without getting violence. That's just how it works. Of course, the author capitalizes on these moments to show just how often humans engage in violence with no real purpose at all other than their own fear. The relationship dynamics explored at the various stages of the story were for me um, the highlight when looking back. I enjoyed the way the human and non-human characters learned how to communicate with one another and form temporary or long-lasting bonds. I liked that the book was broken up into parts, letting the reader know that a new phase was approaching. I will admit the very, the, the very end, like the last page and a half, was a little confusing. I'm not 100% clear how exactly the event happens. Try not to give spoilers here. Um, I need to reread those pages again, but I did like that it left the book on a somewhat hopeful note. Highly recommended to fans of paranormal fiction, complex and dark relationship dynamics, and a fresh take on a popular trope. So yeah, I mean, up until that, like literally like the last page and a half, I was just engrossed in the story. And I guess the way the last page is written, it's like, you know what happens, but you don't really understand. Like I do have to go back and reread it. And maybe that's just me because um, I did the thing where I kind of read and listen to it at the same time. And I think when I got to the end of it, I was listening to it in my car. So I wasn't reading it. So maybe if I go back and actually read it, it'll make more sense to me. But regardless, I really enjoyed being human and look forward to reading more from this author. So now is the time where I say, if you don't want a long review, go ahead and check out. If you don't want spoilers, go ahead and check out. But this is the time for me to talk about Tristan Strong Keeps Punching. So here we go, people. Three, two, one. Ah! Let me tell you. Okay, so the first book, I when I discovered this book, the whole, I mean, I just, my mind was blown. Um, I think I did a spoiler review for the first book, but I kind of missed the second book. Um, this character, this world, I mean, I, I am not hating on Rick Riordan at all because he has entertained so many young adults, um, so many middle grade readers, you know, children are growing up reading his books. And the problem with it is that it's, new spins or interesting spins on stories that have just been told over and over and over again. I'm not Greek, but I so I know so much about Greek culture from reading about it. And I just, and again, not hating on it whatsoever, but it's just, it was so nice to know that he started this whole Rick Riordan Presents thing where he's having giving authors a chance to tell stories from their cultures so now that I've finished the Tristan Strong trilogy really, I've got the other books in the Rick well not all of them but enough to start the other books in in the Rick Riordan present series to read these other stories about um you know pantheons of gods that I've never heard of and folk tales that I've never heard of from different cultures and not just hearing the same stories over and over and so that's what Tristan Strong was for me, an opportunity 
to read the kind of stories that I love, a fantasy story about gods and magic and all this kind of stuff, but where the characters in the story look like me. And I, the first book, whoo, all right. So I'm not gonna recap the whole first two books, but I'm gonna give you just a little bit of, of um, orientation because this book picks up literally where well, not literally, but very close to where the second book left off. So Tristan in the first book is a young boy who is dealing with the grief, the loss of his best friend. Like he literally watched his friend die and he's not coping well because first of all, death is hard to deal with, period, and especially hard to deal with in children. And so because he's not doing great in school and stuff, he gets shipped off to go, um, spend time with his grandparents in the country. And I think I made a comment um, how a lot of these books are predicated on the fact that everybody has some relative in the country they can be sent off to. I don't have a relative in the country that I could have been sent off to, but that's beside the point. So, um, but there Tristan, you know, connects to, um, you know, some of the culture that he has maybe distanced some stuff from living in the city. Um, it's really easy to get caught up in, you know, glitz and glam and the speed of the city life and forget certain things. And so it was a chance for him to slow down and um, just kind of think about what he and his best friend had been working on. And that was um, collecting stories from the diaspora. And so um, he, you know, had this connection with his grandmother who told him the story about the bottle tree. And then lo and behold, he breaks a bottle, <laughs> lets out a hint, and he has to go into this other world that is filled with African gods and African-American folk heroes who have become gods in this other world. And he's basically trying to fix this problem that he kind of started. But again, he's like a 12 year old boy. You know, how much of responsibility can you put on a 12 year old child who's been sheltered from something? It's, it's different if they know exactly what they're doing, but if they don't know what they're doing, and that's kind of how this whole ball got rolling. So he was triumphant. It was a lot of heartache, a lot of, you know, struggles, but he was able to get through the first book and kind of get back home. But then he had to go back because it wasn't over. And um, the characters that you meet in the story, they really tug at your heartstrings, especially, you don't, you don't have to be a person of color to relate to these characters. Let me just clarify that. But as a person of color, especially a black person, you realize these struggles that these characters are having are the exact same struggles that you have, only you don't have magic. <laughs> so in the second book, he's trying to, again, fix a problem that he sort of caused and um, the heroes all unite together to kind of, you know, help with this problem. But then they realize the only way to really fix it is to have these two separate worlds come together. And that's dangerous because, you know, all of these fairy characters and all of these folk heroes lived in this world where they were supposed to be safe and protected and bringing them into our world is going to do exactly the opposite. They're not going to be safe and protected in our world because they all got brown skin. <laughs> but um, so book three starts with Tristan um, in this role of a Nansom where um, he is a storyteller. Um, it's based on his connection to the African god Anansi, who is the trickster god, but he also um, likes to collect stories and tell stories. And so he is an Anansom, he's supposed to be collecting stories, but he's also tasked with trying to find the people from this other world who have been dispersed around the real world, our world. So they have a little tracker and they're trying to find people. They've lost so many people and he misses his friends. He wants to find them. He wants to help them. And he's also trying to be a normal kid. He's literally on a um, family reunion. He's in New Orleans. His home is in Chicago, but he's in New Orleans on this family reunion. And he's trying to enjoy the time with his family, but his mind is clearly elsewhere. 
um, you, we, we are introduced to a new character. He has a young cousin who's who, younger than him. I mean, like he's like, he's 12, <laughs> but he has an even younger cousin who's nine, who they introduce. And of course, you know, the second they introduce the young cousin, your heart's going to be broken at some point because he's going to have to save this kid. I mean, anytime you introduce a character like this, you know, they're doing it because that person is going to have to be saved at some point. Um, and we find out that the relationship between Tristan and a Nancy is um, not as strong as it once was. Um, I mean, they've never been super buddy buddy, but they kind of respected each other, you know, looked out for each other. But a Nancy is basically pissed because his son is missing. He's one of the ones that they've been trying to find. And even though it's really not Tristan's fault, I guess a Nancy kind of holds it against him that he can't find his son. So there's this whole dynamic there where um, the two who are in charge of collecting the stories are not really working together. And of course, that's going to be important later on. And so um, he's on this family reunion and um, they are fine. He somehow finds out that um, children have gone missing and um, it's somehow connected to the characters that he's looking for. Um, because they, I think at one point they were like starting to find the characters, but then they couldn't find them like they were going missing too. And so it leads them to, of course, find some kids, um, some homeless kids. And um, he like um, meets this character called Memphis, which I don't even know if I should say anything about this. I, I feel like the Memphis character, unfortunately, was kind of used as a token. And I'm, again, I'm not hating on this author whatsoever. I appreciate, I guess, what the author was doing by introducing Memphis's character, but I feel like they introduced Memphis and then we never heard from this character ever again. And I really thought that it was gonna turn around and we were gonna see this character at the end. So the, the short end of it is that Memphis is a, is a I think a non-binary character who um, is helping these kids and she's, he or she, um, they, that's what they use, the term they use, but they um, is underground, you know, trying to help these kids survive. And they look at Tristan and they see his at Ingra bracelet and they're like basically asking him to share his power. And he's like, I don't know if I am allowed to like share this power with you. And they just kind of look at him like, okay, whatever, you know, and going about their business. I totally thought that we were gonna see Memphis later and Tristan was, was gonna be like, you know what, I can share this power with you or something, but that didn't happen. So I really, I don't know. I mean, I, I think it was great for, I guess if there's anyone out there who identifies as non-binary to see a character like that in this book, but the fact that the character just kind of fell off, like was that the only purpose for that character being there? I don't know. I, I don't understand how all the, the intricacies of these things work, but I was really excited about the Memphis character and just disappointed that we never saw them again. So anyway, um, Tristan ends up um, finding that there's other people who are um, there who are also connected to gods. And so he meets this girl, I think through Memphis or whatever, who is connected to, I can't, of course, I don't remember the names of all these. I should have make notes. I always say I should make notes, but I don't. And anyway, so he ends up finding basically this whole community of like runaway kids that this one goddess is like protecting, but I'm jumping ahead of myself. So I am all over the place. It's just hard to like get all of my thoughts together because I love the story so much. So he finds Ayana, which is kind of his boo. <laughs> they're both kind of in denial about it, but again they're just kids so it's okay they're it's okay for them to be in denial about it. they're 12 years old and then of course he meets up with his homie <laughs> um gum baby and you know they have a whole love hate relationship they know that they are friends they know that they got each other's back but they're always busting on each other and it's just absolutely hilarious i love gum baby so much and when these two get together it's just calamity and it's great and so he's got the old crew back together for the most part, except they're missing Junior, which of course continues to be the whole animosity between him and Nancy. And they're out trying to save these kids. They're out trying to find other people. And of course, just as in the previous book, all of the adults 
all of the gods, all the folk heroes are telling the kids to stay out of it, let them handle it. But the truth of the matter is that they're not handling it. Now, granted, Tristan is stubborn and he don't listen, but what they're telling him to do is nothing when that's not the thing to tell a kid in a situation like that. They needed to give him something to do. And I understand, again, that the author had a reason for writing the story the way he did, but I kind of wish just for once people in this middle grade genre would just kind of break the mold a little bit. It, it always just always seems to be the kids versus the adults. I mean, just for once, I would like to see the kids and the adult work together before that moment where they have to work together because that's what always happens. And it happens in the story too. Eventually he and the gods do come together to work and it, you know, but before then it's just them telling him to stay out of it. And so anyway, um, we, you know, of course we, we get to see the sun God and we get to see John Henry and, you know, we get to see, um, you know, the, all of our favorite, you know, gods and folk heroes come back and help and you know, steamboat Annie. And the, the, there's, the, there's so much that happens on the river because they start in New Orleans. They end up traveling up the river through Mississippi. And, you know, they're going to all these different places. They do end up back in Chicago where Tristan is from, even though that's not where this particular story begins, but that's how far they travel in this installment to get to the culmination. And along the way, you find out that this journey that they're taking on this river is just a journey through the, um, the struggles and pains of the African-Americans and all of the history that's been literally buried underwater. You visit, you know, old um, cities that have been built on, you know, graves and you visit cities that were wiped out because black people were flourishing there and white people wanted the land, you know, just different, just different stuff. You know, we're, we find, you know, the big bad um, prison system is built on what used to be a plantation. And so you have little slaves and then prisoners who we know are also slaves and this all this culmination is just no matter where you travel in the United States, you have these stories of just black history that's been like obliterated or that's been twisted and manipulated to be something else. And I thought that was something that they depicted in this book was really, really um, poignant. And so the thing I found that was most, I guess, not really shocking, but surprising early on was the haint was back. We thought the haint was buried at the bottom of that ocean, but he came back. King Cotton came back and he is the mastermind behind collecting all of these people, collecting all of these souls. He's doing the job of the Anansom, but he's perverting it. He's collecting these stories to use it against these people, to hold them down, as opposed to collecting these stories and freeing them and telling people about them and allowing people to be empowered by them. And I, I that think that was what really, really hit me was that, you know, Tristan and Nancy were, you know, weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. And, and I don't feel like Tristan wasn't trying not to do it. I do feel like a Nancy was. I feel like a Nancy was so focused on the fact that he couldn't find his son that he was stopped trying to collect the stories. And I feel like Tristan was trying to collect the stories, but he didn't really know why until he realized that King Cotton was using the stories to oppress the people, to keep them down collecting these stories and making sure that no one ever heard them or saw them so that he could continue to collect these people and build up this kingdom out of this disgusting prison of souls. And so I am just going off on a tangent here, but, um, you know, throughout it all, you know, we've got some wise cracks and things happening and, you know, <laughs> Tristan has faced so much and LeBoy is still afraid of heights, <laughs> which I think is hilarious. Um, I do, you know, there are moments that just at me, had me in tears. Um, at, um, seeing a God die in a story, I, mean, you, it, I think we saw it earlier, but like knowing that, that that's gonna be, like this is supposed to be a spoiler review, but there's still a part of me that just doesn't wanna give like too many spoilers away. Um, seeing the transformation of you know one character from being a <laughs> black crow into a pimped out ride later on. If you read the story, you know what I'm talking about. But 
I, I'm no, I'm supposed to stick to my spoilers. I'm rambling. <sighs> the point is, Tristan Strong keeps on punching was the perfect end to this trilogy. And honestly, I hope it's not the end. I'm hoping that this is one of those things that maybe in a couple of years or two, they do something else with it, whether that be an adaptation, whether that be an addition to it or what, I don't know. But this story came along just when I needed. I wish I'd had something like it when I was a kid. And I hope this is not the end. I love the fact that Kwame Mbalia was given a chance to tell the story, but there are other Black authors and other authors of color doing the exact same thing and may deserve a chance to have their stories told and impact people the way I've been impacted. So this was not quite the review I was hoping to do, but it's what I got. Hope you enjoyed it. And um, yeah, <laughs> let me stop my rambling here and say that those were the last two books that I read in December. That was my spoiler review for Tristan Strong Keeps Punching. And let me know what you thought. What are you looking forward to reading in 2022? I have so many ideas, but that's a video for another day. So stay blessed.